Zechariah 4 6. Mm. Zechariah 4, four six. 6. I'll give you a minute. Probably don't know where that is. Okay. On the count of three. One, two, three. Then, then he, he said, said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not, not by might, might nor by power. power. But, but by, by my, my spirit, spirit, says, says the, the Lord, Lord of hosts. Host. Uh, Lord, we ask you to take uh, this message of what you want delivered today. We pray you shake us and bend us and move us to be more like you, that we absorb this into our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my dear. So the prophet Zechariah um, receives this uh, word. Zerubbabel. Uh, I, well, let's not get into his story too far, but um, uh, the, the message was that God was delivering not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So he has a task to do for the Lord, and it looks overwhelming, as many of us will find in our own lives. And you have a choice about how you're going to respond to the problem and to the challenge that you have. And it is clear that God is saying it's not by might, it's not um, by your own strength, nor by power, but by my spirit. And every spiritual challenge, every problem that you have, you need to have this approach to it. You cannot just go flailing in with your own intelligence, your own muscular muscularity. Um, everything underlying that has to be uh, infused with the Spirit of God. We just had the testimony from Jennifer, and this uh, really stirred this up in me. This man did not know Jennifer. He was looking for Jesus, even though he doesn't know Jesus. And in his drug addiction, his poverty state, somewhere in, in a tribal area in Vietnam, he doesn't know where to find Jesus. So he goes on the internet, and why did he send a note to Jennifer? He doesn't even know Jennifer. And he wants her to explain to him the gospel. And I was thinking, uh, we had a discussion about uh, one of our sisters here sharing with someone, a Catholic, about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And the woman got ready to be baptized and everything, and then she stopped and decided she didn't want it. And I remember talking about this, and I could tell that our sister was a bit frustrated, like, man, she almost made it. Well, this applies to this situation. And I reminded our sister that when you wanted to be saved, no one had to force you into the door. You were seeking my wife, Jennifer. You wanted to know how to be saved. And you didn't fight. You came along because God's spirit was touching you. So we can carry someone in the, in the gospel message up to a point, but it, the Spirit of God has to open the door of that person's heart or you will never get in. It'll never work. Now, this drug addict was led by the Holy Spirit to Jennifer. She didn't know him from anybody. And she, he wasn't introduced through a third party. It wasn't like someone saying, oh, you got to talk to Jennifer. He just drops in. Well, this is not an accident. She's sitting at home in our living room and this guy sends her a message and instantly through this rel relatively short process, he is delivered, he is touched by the Holy Spirit and he gives his life to Jesus. And she didn't have to force him. She didn't have to trick him. She didn't have to come up with some clever gospel message. She didn't have to do any of that. But the power of God lifted him in. And there was no obstruction to his heart other than the demons that were fighting. But they came out quickly because he wanted to be saved. And my wife had the anointing that drove them out. And it was not a long process. He didn't have to take a six-week baptism class or wear a robe or do whatever genuflection he needed. Some churches, no rosary, nothing. And he is saved, more saved than the priests who hide behind robes and stained glass windows. He is more saved than seminary graduates in some cases. 
because it is not by might, not by power, not by intellect, or not even by your own goodness, because that man was doing drugs as he was writing the message to my wife, up to the point of salvation, not by goodness. He's covered in demonic tattoos. He's selling drugs, using them. And all he did was have a willing heart, a desire to be saved, and the Holy Spirit directed him. This is how it works. And you don't have to be some genius about theology because it is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah the prophet was getting ready to be called into his ministry, he's taken up into the throne room of God. He sees the angelic beings. He sees the throne of God. He sees the fire around the throne. And he says in Isaiah 6, 5, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim, that's an angel, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my lips and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah acknowledged his sin. Isaiah was not standing before God saying, yeah, baby, take me. I'm good. Use me. He's in dreaded fear, aware of his sin, and he has no way to eliminate the sin from his lips. And the closer we come to God, the more we become aware of the fact that we are sinners in need of him. And he did not do any acts of worship. He didn't do any acts of good deeds up to this point that we know of. Nothing he could do would eliminate the sin from himself. Instead, he proclaims his sin and the Lord sends the angel and the burning coal to remove his sin. He did not remove his own sin. All of the grace we get from God, all of the removal of sin comes from God. And it is not by our might, not by the power of the church. It is by the Spirit of God that touches us and burns away our sin and covers us in the blood of Jesus. You are called. Isaiah was called, but he was a sinner. You and I have been called sinners. And we are unable to burn our sin away until God releases that burning coal and touches us. You will never earn your salvation. You will never earn the cleansing of your soul, the cleansing of all your sins. He has to burn it away. He has to do it for you. And then Isaiah is called in as a messenger, and it's not good news. He's not bringing a message of grace. He's bringing a message of judgment. But God could not even use this man for that purpose until God removed his sin and made him useful. And the same thing for the drug addict. He didn't deserve his salvation. He humbly came to God and the Lord removed it. And I want to say that my wife was not sitting there in uh, watching Billy Graham videos uh, trying to get an idea about how to get somebody saved. And um, she wasn't standing on the street corner with a sign saying, repent or you will perish. The judgment day is coming. Not that that's a bad message, but depending on how you deliver it. Are you delivering it with spiritual pride? People will feel that when you stand out on the street corner preaching condemnation to people. Are you doing it because you think you're so good? See, that is also not necessarily by the Spirit. But when the Spirit is working, people will come to you and you will be going to them and there will be a connection and that you will can see that that person is going to respond differently from other people. There was a council in Jerusalem. Paul uh, was out saving the Gentile world and he was doing miracles and people were getting saved, but they weren't under the Jewish law. So they felt they had to come back and talk to the 
council, the, the leaders in the Jerusalem church. So that included Peter and James and some others. And he tells them what God has been doing through the Holy Spirit, not through synagogues, not through religious requirements, but God bringing Paul to people uh, who have never heard of, of the, the Jewish God, Jehovah. They're pagans. But because the Holy Spirit was leading Paul, miracles were happening and people were getting saved. But it was a new way. It wasn't the old Jewish way. And they hear this and they, they're scratching their heads, wondering whether they could receive this or not and whether it was of God. And then as they're commiserating with one another and the Holy Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, not by the Vatican, not by the church assembly, but by the spirit of God. He said, this is from the Lord. And Peter stood up and the Holy Spirit reminded him. And he said in Acts 15, verse 7, I'm going to cut down here. Brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, between the Jews and the Gentiles. No distinction between the religious and the pagan. And he made no distinction, having cleansed their hearts by what? By faith. The same coal that was taken by the cherubim and burned the sin away from Isaiah. That's the same thing that's going to burn your sin away. Your heart is cleansed by faith. Verse 9, verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. The grace that comes by the Spirit, not by might, nor by power, nor by religion, but by the Spirit. Think of the Spirit burning your sins away because of your election by the grace of God. Nothing, no one will get saved other than that. And I don't care how many evangelism classes you take at the Billy Graham Center. And I got saved through Billy Graham, so I'm not de denigrating Billy Graham. But I'm saying, unless the Spirit is there. I heard Billy Graham many times preaching on TV. I never got saved until that day, until the day that the Holy Spirit touched me. And I was called by God to come to him. It's not a formula. It's, it's the open invitation that only comes from God through the Holy Spirit. And all ministry and everything that you're going to do with God depends upon the Holy Spirit, not by your might, not by my power, not by any church name or denomination. And in verse 12, and all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. No signs, no wonders, no salvation. There has to be power that comes from the Holy Spirit. And then he comes to the conclusion in verse 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not, this is James speaking, that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Very simple. So now Paul is excited and he goes back out to the Gentile believers. And he can't wait to share this message because Jews had been going there and saying, no, you got to be circumcised. You got to go to the synagogue. You got to do it the old Jewish way, the religious way. And Paul's saying, uh-uh, that's not the way I got saved. Paul got saved on the road to Damascus. And he was not seeking Jesus. He was seeking to kill Jesus. He was seeking to kill the body of Christ and throw them into jail. And he didn't get saved because he deserved it. He was saved because Christ chose him. And Christ, the spirit of Jesus, met him on the road of Damascus and he was saved and he knew that. He knew that all his goodness did not amount to salvation. So he was in a hurry to get out and talk to the brothers and sisters. And as he's going on his way, he has a plan to go to what was called Asia at the time. And I believe that's Eastern Turkey. Think of it that way. And, and that's where he thought he was going to bring this message. But when he's headed out there in, in Acts 16, 
he can't enter Asia. The Holy Spirit forbid him from bringing the message there. And we don't know what that looked like, but he knew that the Spirit was saying, don't go, don't go. So he's listening to the Holy Spirit. He knows he has to go somewhere, but he doesn't know exactly where to go. And as he's on his way, his little journey, and all he's doing is carrying that message I just said. He just said, you need to do these four things. Don't eat the strangled meat, meat from strangled animals, the blood, uh, don't do, you know, and abstain from sexual immorality. And now he's not relying on his strength. He's not relying on religious laws and obligations. And as he goes out there, he's now listening to the Holy Spirit who spoke to him from the very beginning, carried through that council, carrying on the journey. And then he has a dream. Well, first of all, and then he tried to enter a city called Mysia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. The Holy Spirit stopped him, and then the, the Spirit of Jesus stopped him, and I don't, I, it could be the same Spirit, or it could be something different. The Bible doesn't explain that, and I'm not going to try to either. But the Spirit of God stopped him and would not allow them. So he tried twice, and he was redirected on two occasions. So he doesn't know where to go. He just knows he has to go. And as uh, he is there, he has a vision of a man dressed as a Macedonian, and he believes the vision is telling him to share the gospel with the Macedonian people. So he redirects. He starts walking with his crew over to Macedonia. The Macedonia is a, a region around Greece, but it's not a city. It's a region. So he doesn't know where to go in Macedonia. He gets to the area of Macedonia, and they enter a city called Philippi. And in Philippi, on the Sabbath day, just like you're doing right now, there's no church to go to. So he takes his bros and he goes outside the city because he's looking for a place to pray on the Sabbath. That's what it says. He has no ministry plan here. What is he doing? He's living his life as a Christian. His routine, as Jennifer is, has a routine of studying the Bible every day, of, of teaching people and, and sharing the gospel. That's her routine. She has a routine of connecting with Christians on Facebook or whatever communities there are. And that is all she was doing. She wasn't looking for the next victim or the next, she doesn't like when I say that, the next, the next person for her to pounce her Christianity on and shove it down their throats to get another, I saved that person and I'm going to tell everybody about it so I can look really good. She's not doing that. She gets up, she has her coffee, she goes through her routine of reading the Bible, of praying, and just talking to people. And this is what Paul's doing. No church, he goes outside the city by the riverbank for a place to pray, which he would do every Sabbath. It's his routine. Why is it his routine? Because that's who he is. He's constantly led by the Spirit of God, and yet he doesn't know every step or every place to go. He doesn't try to find those things out. I, you know, some, I've had people come up to me, and they'll say, uh, pray for me. I want to know what God wants me to do, right? What's my mission for God? What's my God? How about just living a life like Jennifer, just living a Christian life with the habits and the routines, but not routines that are dry and pointless, but something that is alive inside you that your heart just loves Jesus and it makes you, it propels you throughout the course of your day to be thinking godly thoughts, to be thinking things that he wants you to do. And as you're going and you don't change your routine because you want to go to church on Sunday, you want to worship God with your fellow believers. You don't want to stay home. You want to be there. You want to be in, involved in the Bible study. You want to be involved in prayer. Every day you seek the Lord. You get your Bible out. You start praying. And as you go off into your little journey, the Lord is on your heart and mind as it was on Paul's. And you don't have to seek the things of God that you have to do. You don't have to ask him, What's my, do I have to go to China? I heard I had some, someone prophesy I'm going to China to save, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got to go to India, well, right? I've talked about this. But, and, and they're always looking for that big splash. And Paul's not looking for a big splash, so why are you? He's got a simple message. He's got his testimony, as Mal just said. What are you going to tell a Muslim in their house with the husband? 
Boom. I mean, that gives anybody a chill. You don't know. But you tell them your testimony. This is what God did for me. He healed my mother. What? Not by might nor by power. You're not arm wrestling the Muslim head of the home. You're just sharing gently and peacefully the truth of what you know to be true. And the Spirit of God will work through that. And Paul, as he goes out, and notice they're going, looking for a place to pray on the Sabbath. That's like your Sunday, right? So that should be a normal thing for you. Pray. And they prayed together. And I'm so glad. This is the, the, when you guys are on Wednesdays and you're praying together, it's so encouraging. And the Holy Spirit is there. And I've watched you guys grow into consistent participants. You don't even think about it anymore. You're just that bing. I hear the zoom. Bing, 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 bing. I can usually guess the order, but you know, it's <laughs> because you have been transformed and it, you want to be there. And you know, I know we're tired, we're busy, but the desire to connect and to be a part of that. And then just wonderful yesterday, I just loved it so much. Um, and then as we're breaking into tears after worshiping and praying, it's priceless. And I'm not crying alone. You know, I got you crying with me, you big baby. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit's cracking the hard shell in our heart and rejuvenating us, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And there he is as he goes out with his brothers to no, no building. They're, in the, they're not even in the Marriott. They're out by the river. And they go to sit down, and next to them is this group of women. And in that group of women... Remember, the Holy Spirit told him to go to Macedonia to share the gospel. Paul didn't have a crusade. He didn't have a thousand people come up. He's just going about his business, sitting down to pray, just like you would if we didn't have a church here. And we, we had to go somewhere to meet and fellowship and, and it's kind of house churchish, but better because you're outside and you guys want to have a picnic. I know that and, and go outside. <laughs> so that's what he's doing. No plan. And he sees this group of women, and they start talking. And I'm seeing this in my head play out. The women are chatting, as you would expect. And Paul, instead of saying, would you guys be quiet? We're trying to worship over here. We got this Christian stuff going on here. I'm an apostle. Would you shut up? I got apostle stuff to do here. And he doesn't say that. They start having a conversation together with these women. And I can see, we find out that Lydia is a dye saleswoman. She's got a business selling clothing dye. And she's not from Philippi, she's from Theatira. She came in and she's talking to these women and she's a saleswoman. <laughs> it says she was a believer in God. So she's a Jew who believes in God, but she doesn't have Jesus. Why is she out there by the riverbank, not in the synagogue? And she's probably selling her stuff to the women. But it says she believed in God. Why didn't she go to church that day? Maybe she got tired of going to a dead church. Maybe she's tired of the religious rules. And she knows God, but God isn't in that house. So she starts to get a little bored with the whole Jewish thing, the whole religious thing. I can be more productive going out. And if I go to Philippi, because that's a leading Roman colony, they've got some money over there. I'm going to make some money. I'm going to talk to these women. Now, there are good Jewish business men and women. Um, we lived in Israel. I know they're, they're very good, very smart business people. I can see that she's kind of like this, maybe. So while she's doing her thing, Paul is sitting there, and in a natural way, he says, how are you ladies doing? Oh, we're doing well. What are you guys doing? Well, um, we're getting ready to pray. Pray? Pray what? Oh, well, we're Jews, uh, but we believe in Jesus, and we're praying about Really? So as he's talking to them, and they share, he shares the gospel in the conversation to these women. And it says in Acts uh, 16, let me read it to you, Acts 16, 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatira, a seller of purple goods. 
She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. I've seen this so many times. <laughs> I start talking either to a group or to an individual. I can tell right away whether the heart is open or closed. And I can see it in churches. When I go to other churches and some people are falling asleep and what well, happens once in a while here too. And they're, they're closed. Nothing's going in. And I'm looking at them. I, you, could, you could set off a firecracker next to them. You couldn't wake them up. Remember? The, the guy? I've seen that many times. But here's one with an open heart. Attention. She paid attention to what Paul said. I know whether people are paying attention or not. Because they ask questions, they change. It draws them into relationship usually because they want to talk about it. They want to live it out. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention. The Lord opened her heart. How? Is Jesus sitting there? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Paul wasn't forcing the door open. He wasn't rebuking her. You're going to hell if you don't expect, if you don't take Jesus. No sign. Didn't hit her over the head of the Bible. He didn't even have one. <laughs> he had a conversation. Talked to them. Told him about what he was about to do. He doesn't have to struggle through this evangelism to be a useful Christian. He just is a Christian. He's just there. He's just doing what he always does, showing up to church, showing up to pray, just sharing the gospel. Here, here's my life story. And then God can open the heart. You cannot open it. And if the woman's all dressed and ready to go to the baptism and she stops at the door, that's her choice. You did your part. You told her about the Lord. You told him your testimony. You can't force people to get saved. <laughs> you can't force them. And she was baptized. There's a river right there. You don't need a church building. You don't need denominational gowns and denominational studies and all of these other things. If your heart is open and the spirit has opened it, there's no stopping you. The Ethiopian was baptized in some puddle on the way after Philip shared the gospel. 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit opened their hearts. No open heart, you're just taken aback. Open heart, you're being baptized in Jesus Christ by the Spirit. And her household as well. For those struggling with unsaved households, Perhaps it's something in you that hasn't been, maybe the Holy Spirit is not working through your open heart. Maybe you've closed off the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe. I'm not saying that's always the case, but you need to ask yourself that question. She urged us, now after she was saved, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She was begging them after she got saved. She was instantly changed. And it came out in her character. It came out in her attitude towards those that shared the gospel with her. She wanted to be hospitable. She wanted to give from whatever she had to Paul and the brothers. When you are saved by the Holy Spirit, not by man, and your heart is opened by God, you can't wait to love someone, to show generosity to them, to give your time, to give what you have. She begged to give something back. No open heart, no spirit, no generosity, no gratitude, no love. Now there was another girl. There's three I want to talk about here. He's going back out to the place of prayer on another day. And a slave girl who does divination and makes money for her master is there and meets them. And she says, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she's doing this day after day. Finally, Paul says, demon, out. Well, how did he know? 
Why didn't he assume Lydia had the same problem? How did he know Lydia was going by the spirit of God and not a spirit of divination? Or many times what I encounter is witchcraft. They look religious. They talk about Jesus. They talk about all the things in the church. But they have another spirit. And only by the spirit of discernment can you tell. I can tell right away nowadays. <laughs> Painful lessons learned. And that's why I say, don't bring people in who are rebellious and they don't want to repent. I don't need them. I don't need this spirit of divination in my church or around me. Why? This woman was saying the right thing, but she didn't get baptized. She didn't have a change of heart where she showed love and devotion to Paul or to any of the brothers and sisters. She was just there saying, yeah, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She didn't love Paul. Lydia loved him. Get in my house, man. I'm going to cook for you. I'm going to show my gratitude and I don't want relationship with you. That's why I want you in my house, because I love you. The woman that had the spirit of divinations just broadcasting, talking. I don't need talkers in my life. I need people who love me. We were talking about that in the Bible study today. I need people who have changed. This, Lydia changed the day she got saved. This man who had a drug addiction changed the day he was born again. And the spirits left him. And he showed gratitude. And Jennifer said it in the testimony. He said, I have joy. If you say you're saved and you have no joy when you got saved, you're not saved. It's impossible. You can't go from a dark pit in hell and into heaven and not feel joy. You've been deceived. If you say, yeah, I, I accepted Jesus. I got baptized. Yeah, yeah. Well, have you changed? Do you have any love and appreciation? What's different about you? Are you happy about it? No, who cares? I don't care. Did you ever show love to people that you are changed? You might be a slave girl, a talker, and maybe somebody's got to cast something out of you, if they're generous. And then there's the third person. This is all in Philippi, and it's a jailer. After Paul cast the demon out of the slave girl, they arrested him. <laughs> and that's typical if you start casting demons out. People are going to get upset. And they threw him in jail. And in jail, he starts singing with Silas. And this place shakes under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the chains break. And the prisoners are getting ready to, the jailer thinks they're all going to run away. And back in those days, the jailer would be tortured and killed if any of those prisoners got out. So he's ready to kill himself. And then Paul says, no, stop. We're all here. He goes, what? And he puts the sword down, and he is terrified. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear. This is verse 29 in Acts 16. Before Paul and Silas, then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? You don't have to force the jailer into the kingdom. You don't have to force him to say the name of Jesus. He wants the name. He wants by the Spirit of God. He can't wait to be saved. If you have someone who's dragging their feet about salvation, let them go. Because that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you'll see the person. They'll be a broken mess usually. They'll cry. You can see the sincerity in their face, the sincerity in their response. And they want to know how to be saved. Those other ones, you don't have to trick them. You don't have to get on to sign something or say the little catchy prayer. Let the Holy Spirit, if the heart is opened by God, they will be saved. If it's not, don't waste your time. Press on. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 38? They were cut to the heart. What must we do to be saved? And the same message from Peter's mouth is what Paul said. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. 
And he took them the same hour, the jailer did, of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Instant change. What did the jailer do? He didn't just walk around talking about the gospel. These men are telling you the way to get saved. These Go to this church. Do this. you got to say Yeshua. you got to be baptized like this. Turn around three times and be dunked in the... <laughs> he didn't say that. The jailer washed their wounds. The jailer took him into the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. He washed their wounds. I'll tell you, if you're born again, if you're saved by the Holy Spirit, you will have a compassion to wash somebody else's wounds. You will show gratitude. You will show love. You will show compassion. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> your dream last night. That is the difference. Not the talk. It's the walk. You will have a desire to wash someone's wounds. That was the thing that happened to me when I got saved. I thought, everybody needs this. Everybody needs their wounds. Everybody has a hole. Everybody has some kind of wound. They need love. They need compassion. They need deliverance. They need healing. I want to do that. God, help me. I don't know how to help these people. So you start off little by little. You start doing things. Jennifer starts... Uh, well, when we shared gospel with people, they didn't get saved. But I want to help. I want to, I don't know how to do a Bible study. I'm going to do a Bible study with uh, the four of us that night, right? And then it turns into 50, some, you know. Jennifer is forced into the prison. She wants to help, but she doesn't feel comfortable going to prisons. And then God opens up and 179 people are saved. But because... We're surrounded by people with wounds, wounded hearts, wounded souls, wounded bodies. And if you're not moved to compassion, something's wrong with you. You've got to start off doing something. Remember, Paul wasn't having some grand strategy. He's just moving forward as a regular Christian, an anointed Christian with an apostolic calling. But your calling is going to be different from Paul's. It doesn't matter. Just start walking to Macedonia. And when you get to Macedonia, you might just sit down to pray someplace. And there might be one woman out of the group that says yes to the Lord and is saved and shows gratitude and wants to have relationship with you. And then we know after he's with the jailer and they let him out, where did he go? He went back to Lydia's house, and it says the brothers were there also. More people got saved. How'd they get saved? I bet Lydia, with her big salesman woman mouth, was probably talking about Jesus. I met these guys by the river, and, you know, I, I just felt the love of God come on me. And, and, and then I got, I'm sure she got filled with the Holy Spirit, because back in those days, if you weren't if you weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit, they didn't think you were saved. Well, I don't know how that affects us today, but that's true. And he couldn't wait to go. They had a relationship now, and he knew he could go into that house because Lydia loved him. And it wasn't a burden to her. She wanted him in the house. The jailer took the prisoners out of the prison and fed them in his own house and tended to their wounds night and day. But the slave girl, she was just mouthing what a demon was telling her. And it was the gospel. But she hadn't changed. Don't fill your church with slave girls. <laughs> you want to be in the house of Lydia. You want to be at the table with the jailer. By the way, we don't even know his name. And his whole household was saved. Not pretend saved, real saved. Not fake Christians saved, real saved. And they were compelled by the Spirit to love back, to give back, to attend to other people's needs. If you do not take any step, if there's nothing touch, touching your conscience to do a good deed for someone else, or to give generously, or to care about those that minister to you, 
or anybody who shared the gospel with you or prayed for you to be baptized in the Holy Ghost or any brother and sister in Christ or anybody else. You don't care. I'm just going to live my little life right here. You don't have to do super duper. If someone has a wound, you attend to them. Be a good Samaritan. Small steps leading to bigger things later on. You don't have to force it. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Paul was a disaster when it comes to public speaking. He was not a super apostle. 1 Corinthians 2, 1-5, 1 Corinthians 2, 1-5, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's not about teaching you more and more religion. It is about the Holy Spirit touching you and the power of God, not the power of man. Religion will kill. The letter kills. The spirit gives life. It's not about my ability to be an attractive servant of God in my physical appearance, although I'm sure you all wish I could be. It's not in my cleverness of speech. I could talk in a beautiful, wonderful, eloquent way with all the big religious words that I can think of or someone could write down for me. And if the spirit is not in that, it will have no godly effect on you. If the spirit were not on Jennifer when she shared the message with the drug addict, he'd go away wondering what that was all about. Well, let me try Buddhism. <laughs> I don't know. She was talking about sanctification and all of this and then the end times and, the, you know. You need the spirit of God and you need to walk with the spirit of God and you need him every day and you don't need to be calculating how you're going to save the world. It'll just happen as he leads you. Now, when you look at Paul's letters, now let me, further on in the book of Acts, we've got, it says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And the demon jumped on them and beat the heck out of them, tore their clothes off, don't come in and use the name of Jesus without your own relationship with him. Do not rely on the spirit of God's power by just talking about religious stuff unless you have a relationship yourself and you are with the faith of God and the spirit is on you. Don't just go talking religion, talking Jesus, talking Christ stuff. The demons will beat the hell out of you. You've got to have a relationship. You have to be born again. And you have to have an ongoing relationship relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul writes a letter to the Philippians. He went to Philippi. Nobody's saved in Philippi. The Holy Spirit shows him Macedonia. It's not the church of Macedonia. He didn't write the letter to Macedonia. He wrote the letter to F Philippi. The believers in Philippi who were not there when he started that journey. They got saved through the Holy Spirit. Talking to Lydia. Talking to the jailer. They start talking to their household. People start getting saved. And now you have a church in Philippi. And Paul did not write a book about his missionary journey to make money and stick it on the shelf in some bookstore. Paul never wrote a book. Paul never made a movie about his life. Paul never profited from religion. I, it disgusts me when <laughs> the books that people write. 
What did Paul have? He had a scroll with the Old Testament, and then he and some of the other believers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote letters to house churches and individuals, like Philemon's about us, Minnesota. <laughs> he was a house church leader. He wrote a letter to the house church in Philippi, a small group like us, or maybe a little bigger. We don't know, but it's not huge, okay? It's to a house church. He talks to people by first names in his letters. What you're reading are letters in this part of the Bible to small churches, to small groups of people in specific geographic locations where the Holy Spirit led Paul and where people truly got saved. He didn't write a book. He didn't write a book. And, he, and I'll conclude here. He writes Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. If you're born again, if your heart's been open, you'll start to look at the interests of others, not yourself. Philippians 1, 15 to 18. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. If you feel jealous when I tell you the story about Jennifer leading someone to Christ, and you want to show that you can do the same thing, that you're just as good as she is, you are a jealous person. And that God is not going to use. But if you rejoice over the fact that this man was saved in Vietnam and used Jennifer, not that she's Christ, but Christ is in her, and you collapse because you praise the Lord, because the Holy Spirit was the one that led that man into salvation through her. But if you're jealous, you start talking back, well, Jennifer, she's just showing off. <laughs> God will not use you. That's evil. But if you're like the jailer, and you're humble, and you're grateful that Paul led you to salvation, or you're grateful that one of us has ministered to you, and you want to give, and the Holy Spirit is working on you, and you can't wait to wash somebody's wounds, and you're rejoicing every time you hear somebody get saved, then the Holy Spirit is working on you. Who got excited about that story today? Don't, act, don't raise your hand. I did. I got so excited about it, I wrote a sermon about it. And I'm quietly listening to Jennifer talk about it. And I'm, I'm, this is just, it's like, I, I know that when I really have a relationship with Jesus, I just need to move through life and God will use me. I don't have to put on a big show. I don't have to make a big deal out of it. It just happens. Humble. Now, if you're sitting also wondering, why not me? Why didn't I get used by this? Remember, Paul was in constant relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. When it was Sabbath day, he was out praying. He wasn't playing golf. And the opportunities just start to come out of your life. He's not at work. He's not making tents that day. He's doing what God would have him do, and he does it out of his heart. Just live that way. Now, Lord Jesus, we pray, Holy Spirit, you convict us of any jealousy, any pride, any selfish ambition, or any reliance on our own might and power. Lord, this church is not sending out commercial advertisements to draw people in. So, Lord, we ask you to let the Holy Spirit work through each of us that we can go out to the riverbank, that we can go out to the place of prayer, and we can have a conversation with those in business. And we ask you, God, to open up their hearts and that we just naturally share the gospel with our neighbors, as our sister Mal did. 
and that we just give the testimonies. We share the simple gospel, but we do it through the anointed, uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray that anybody who's frustrated that they think they should be doing more and they're not, that they get this. They understand what this message means and that you'll bring people and the union of their open heart and our hum humble serving and sharing will result in those being saved who are the elect who are called. Holy Spirit, we ask you to, to convict us, to touch us right now. That just like our own salvation and the cleansing of our sins, we require a reliance on you, on Jesus. And so do we require you throughout our walk and through our service that we're not relying on ourselves. Lord, there are people all around us with wounds. We ask you, God, to enlighten us, to see them, so that we can minister your love and compassion to them, that we're not just focused on our own little world, ourselves. As the Spirit leads you, please pray.